a very good morning to everybody here at the TRT World Forum. My name is David Foster, and I just have a couple of announcements as people take their seats uh, to make before we begin this fascinating session about transforming humanitarian aid. And these are to do with the modern age, social media, hashtag, if you're looking for Twitter, TRT World Forum. We're also apparently up on something called a periscope which is a live stream, I'm told, of, of Twitter. And if you want to tell your friends or you particularly want to tune in, it's Periscope on Twitter, hashtag TRT World Forum. Uh, do download the TRT Forum app and uh, take some time to evaluate, if you can, the, uh, the usefulness, as you see it, of the, the app. You can download know that from the App Store, there is a survey involved in that. Now, enough of the housekeeping. This is what we're going to be talking about today. last year. There are tens of thousands of people living here and aid agencies tell us that they just can't supply them with enough basic necessities. This is exactly the kind of situation that the Turkish Foreign Minister Melvut Cavacolu has come to assess. May I welcome onto stage our participants, first of all from the Prime Minister's Office, Prime Minister and Under Secretary of the Republic of Turkey, Dr. Fuat Oktay, if I could ask you to come onto the stage. Sorry, sir, I couldn't see you there. Now, I must explain that Dr. Oktay has to go off on Prime Ministerial business in about 50, 45 minutes' time. So if you see him sneaking off the stage, it's not because he's bored, he's, he's on official business. Dr. Oktoy, thank you very much indeed. Mukesh Kapila, Professor of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs at the University of Manchester, if I could welcome you up here. Took part in World Health Organization's humanitarian aid efforts after the tsunami that devastated Southeast Asia. And we'll be talking about that, whether the aid went to the right place. Richard Falk is with me, Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University, a man who occasionally finds himself in hot water because of his outspoken comments, and we're hoping to hear some of those today, particularly with regard to Palestinian matters and UNRWA. And we have Kani Torum. Welcome, sir, to the stage founder of Doctors Worldwide and former Turkish ambassador to Somalia, who's going to talk particularly about Turkey's aid efforts in Africa with regard particularly to Somalia. We have a slightly truncated time scale. Each one of our participants knows that. I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a benefit. We have to get a great deal into a shorter space of time. Now, we're going to be talking about transforming humanitarian aid. The message from the previous session was that we are all in this boat together. And the impression I think a lot of us got is that many people are having to bail very fast with whatever implement they have to get the water out of this boat in which we are all together because that boat at the moment is sinking. We have to discover a way of patching it up, making it a better, more seaworthy boat, something in which we can all sail relatively safely into the future. Now, yesterday I was standing out in the foyer here. I was accosted, if you like, by a member of uh, our company's staff who was working for Digital Media and said, could I say in 10, 15 seconds what I thought the purpose of this forum actually was? And if you distill it, if you concentrate minds, it comes down to, and this is what I said, if people don't talk, people can't listen. <coughs> and if people don't listen nothing changes. And that, I believe, is why we are here today, to listen, to talk, to take away other people's opinions, perhaps in whatever field of work 
we happen to be involved in, we will use the experience of conversations here to try and change things for the better. We are particularly talking about aid today, not just the refugees that you saw in that piece with Shamim Chowdhury just there, but aid in terms of help in whatever form it takes. Is it necessary? Why is it necessary if it is? Where does it go? Who decides where it goes? Most, but most particularly, why do we target aid in certain areas and what do we need to change? I'm going to invite each one of our panelists to say a few words. They were told initially it was going to be 20 minutes. We've, we've, we've all agreed that that's far too long, so it's just going to be a few minutes. Although I have to say that uh, Mukesh did tell me he was going to try and beat the Chinese leaders three and a half hours yesterday, but we talked him out of that. So if I could ask Dr. Oktai first of all, I'm going to take my seat over there, and I'd like you to tell us, if you wouldn't mind, sir, where you think things have been going right, perhaps, and equally where you believe things have been going wrong in our approach. Dr. Oktai, thank you. Thank you, David. <coughs> Good morning again. Uh, I'd like to thank the TRT World first for bringing us together within, a, within such a great distinguished event indeed. Maybe before telling you it's whether the things are going well or not, I guess we all know what the answer to that question is. And we all know whether the things are going well or not. I think the question is, the answer is very clear. But let me just get into remind you a couple of statistics. I've just uh, looked into a couple of statistics over here and then maybe tell you what's going on and then what should, how we should refine the humanitarian uh, aid system maybe, if we can. Since I'll be leaving early, I'll appreciate if you can just give me a couple of more minutes. I might not have enough time later uh, to continue. These are the figures indeed all of you uh, know very well, just as a reminder indeed. 65 to 66 million people forcibly displaced. 40 million nearly out of 65 are internally, internally displaced. 22 and a half million are refugees and nearly 3 million are asylum seekers. Syrians, Colombians and Afghans are the top three forcibly displaced populations. Again, 55% of those refugees are from Syria, Sudan, and Afghanistan. Again, the major refugee hosting countries, Turkey ranking the first with 3.5 million people, Pakistan with 1.4, and Lebanon with 1.1 million. Again, the top three largest donor countries, again, these are the figures you all know very well indeed, just as a reminder. Turkey ranks second with six billion. This is the six, this six billion is the reported amount or the reports that's generated through UN and UNHCR basically. The exact figure that we have spent as Turkey to the humanitarian aid is a lot more that, than that figure. Mainly the, the amount that we spent for the three and a half million refugees within Turkey is not counted within this, these figures indeed, which is nearly right now $30 billion since the beginning of the Syrian crisis especially. As far as we uh, consider as the percentage of the amount of the GN, GNI, Turkey ranks first. Again, with the Syria crisis, couple of figures again. Syria had nearly 22 million population before the crisis. People in need right now is 13 and a half million. These are basically uh, either displaced or nearly displaced people in need. 12 million out of those 13 and a half are the displaced people within Syria. Again, 6.3 million are the internally displaced and 5.5 million people are refugees within Syria. Again, Turkey with 3.2 million ranks first as the hosting country for Syrians. 
Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq are the following countries. So what we have done for Syrians, before again getting into the theoretical discussions, let me say, as in many cases indeed, as soon as anything happens, whether it's a disaster or uh, whether that's a conflict, whether that's a war, whatever it is, Turkey does not wait to see who those people are, what their religion or ethnicity is, or what their sexes are, or which geography they belong to. We directly move, we do have a very dynamic system to move forward and start providing humanitarian aid. Can I ask you a question, sure. Doctor, first of all? Um, an awful lot of the work that's being done uh, with the Syrian refugees in Turkey is done simply for humanitarian reasons. But I'm not certain that aid is always provided simply for altruistic reasons. For? For the most honorable of reasons. Sometimes it is done because it is in the self-interests right. of the country providing that aid, whether it be to right. a, a country that's where That's exactly where I am getting into. Well, then I shouldn't have stopped. That's, that's exactly where I am getting into. <laughs> exactly. So what we did, I was indeed heading one of the organizations that was responsible to respond to those humanitarian crises indeed, called AFA, Turkey's Disaster, and, uh, Disaster Management Agency, basically. We do have a couple of other organizations like TICA, developmental agencies, Red Cross, and NGOs as well indeed. We directly went into the field and started receiving people, providing humanitarian aid, of course. By humanitarian aid, usually what people think is food and security maybe. It was the beginning of 2011, I guess. But when you see them as human beings, the things, the picture totally changes. People do not just need food and security. They should be given. They should be the given rights for any single individual throughout the entire world. When we realized that the crisis was going to continue, then we decided to treat them in a, a lot more uh, systematic, let me say, and holistic uh, because it is also in Turkey's interest without to keep any, these people without any happy any, and healthy, isn't it? Without any uh, kind of like self-interest considerations. We start providing housing first through camps. I don't know whether you have seen our camps or not. No matter how perfect a camp is, camp is a camp. So we should state that first. We start providing housing. Then we start providing uh, healthcare services, then we realize that there is a whole generation out there. Right now it's nearly 3.2 million people, re Syrian refugees, 3.5 million refugees in total indeed, half of which are kids less than 18 years old. So these kids need education. If you do not provide that education, then that will mean a lost generation. That would mean a risk for the next generation indeed. So we did start providing education. Yeah, which to is also in Turkey's self-interest to make definitely. sure that the people are happy. To I must point at the clock, if I may, over here and tell you, everybody, it's inaccurate. It says 31 minutes. We have a great deal more than 31 minutes. That may be the countdown to when Dr. Oktay has I, to leave. But that's why I'm looking at you. I, I don't look at okay. the clock. Well, Kesh, let me ask you, in, in terms of the, the general overall picture, have we moved away from a model where countries used to provide aid simply because it was in their long-term interests. Let uh, me... <coughs> sorry, if I may, Dr. Oktay, I, I must get on to Mukesh because of the, the time limit, then we've got plenty of time for questions. Would you mind just, I, I, if I just give you a couple of... Please carry Would on. you mind? Just since I am, you'll, you'll have more time to discuss Please. indeed. The results as the humanitarian system, what we try to respond is, we are trying to respond to the end results. What are the end results? That's basically suffering, hunger, famine, poverty, conflicts, wars, etc., terror. 
But when we look at the causes, the root causes, they are different indeed. Unless we do address those root causes, no matter how much humanitarian aid we provide, we will not be able to solve the problem. We will not be ease the problem either. What we are going to do, we are just going to ease the pressure on those who create those root causes. So we have to first address the root causes. Second, we have to, while providing humanitarian aid, we have to put more pressure on those actors who create or promote or foster those root causes. Third, we have to take a holistic approach and a systematic approach to respond to the humanitarian needs of those people. And again, maybe one more issue is we should not create a dependent or, or welfare society while create, providing humanitarian aid. Unfortunately, the current system throughout the entire world creates a dependent and welfare society. Rather, we have to be investing internationally through maybe we have to promote the corporate, uh, social corporate, uh, maybe corporate social responsibility. Through, I don't mean that corporates should somehow help certain agencies like UN or EU and others. They should be investing into the field and let the refugees or forcibly displaced people to work in those statements. The last maybe alternative for a refined approach is redesigning the international institutions, like the UN, agents, UN agencies, UNHCR, UNDP, OCHA. We have to have more interrelated and uh, integrated system approach over there. They are very, they work for the same cause, but totally in different areas and not much uh, interrelated indeed. And of course, as Turkey, we do have a motto regarding the Security Council, world is bigger than five. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed, Dr. Atek. <laughs> Sentiments which we will, will now examine, and, and okay, you suggested to me before we began uh, that I should ask you what you thought was working, what you thought was broken, how perhaps it can be fixed. Now, Dr. Oktay, to some extent there has alluded to the fact that we, as an international community, have perhaps changed our approach from one where money was just given to governments uh, for the benefit not only of those, in those people in those countries, but also for the benefits of the people who are giving the money for their own self-interest. Do, do you believe we are generally moving away to more, a more self-dependent model rather than a model that is imposed upon people? I. I hope I'm allowed to disagree. Sure, please. I think we are being very complacent. Just two years ago, we assembled in this very city, thanks to the generosity of the Turkish government, and made the world's first ever World Humanitarian Summit. You were there. You were our host. I was. As the host. You know, 180 countries came. 9,000 people came. They made 3,000 commitments to transform the humanitarian system. A new agenda for humanity was proclaimed in this city. Two years later, what's happened? That's the question to ask. We are good at making international conferences. We are not good at delivering on them. And I just hope that this first forum of many to come will be different. I wish I could agree that we are all in it together. I mean, I'd like us to be in it together, but that is not true. Some of us are not, some of us don't even have the luxury of being in a leaking boat. We're not even on the boat. And some of us, by the way, are in, uh, in the first class cabin of the, of the boat. You cannot have human solidarity and an international humanitarian system on that particular basis. That's the reality. And why? And here's the six uh, problems which I think we have at the moment. Firstly, the appeals from the international system, whether it's the UN or the other agencies, these are all censored. So when an organization appeals, it appeals for what it thinks it can do. It's not a total embodiment of humanitarian needs. 
So if UNHCR says, I can look after so many refugees, it will appeal for that. But the number of people displaced is much greater than that. If a health organization says, and so on and so forth, you, you get the point. Who is to speak for the people around the world whose needs are not even a statistic in the appeals? We only know what the needs are based on the numbers we are given, and those numbers are collected by the agencies who, are, who have calculated them on the basis of their capabilities to implement, not genuine needs. Who is bearing witness to unknown needs? Our second challenge is that the global humanitarian system doesn't belong to all of us. It is not global. More than nine out of every 10 government dollars given to humanitarian assistance comes from just 20 countries. Countries like Turkey, European countries, North American countries. With five governments contributing two thirds of all the humanitarian assistance in the world. How can you talk of a world humanitarian system and all being in the same boat? When the burden of providing for humanitarian need is just being satisfied by a few people. What has happened to the 100 and other, 190 other countries who should also be doing their share of it? And they can't say uh, that uh, it's because they're poor or they're not as developed as the others. Number two system, that's the number two problem. The number three problem we have is that the practice of humanitarianism is a lottery. Now, in a real lottery or in a dice, if you flick it up, heads or tails in a, in a, in a decent di uh, dice, it'll be fair. Sometimes it's heads, sometimes it's tail. That's a fair lottery. But the humanitarian system is not even a lottery. If it is, it's an unfair lottery. This is because 54% of international humanitarian funding goes to just five countries. And I would nothing against those five countries, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, South Sudan, mm -hmm. Ethiopia, they need it, and they need it desperately. That is not our argument. And Syria was the largest recipient with two, of the $2.1 billion. And that's great. No, no one wants to take any money away from, from that. But what about the 90 other countries who also have their own share of misfortune and misery to endure? The fourth issue is that not all suffering is equally compelling. Not every baby is equally cute. In 2016, 99% of, say, Burundi's humanitarian appeal was funded while only 4% of Gambia's appeal was funded. And we've forgotten about Darfur, we've forgotten about the Central African Republic, we've forgotten about many, many other, other situations. How can we say that we have a system where everyone is on the same boat? That is, I'm afraid, so far, wishful thinking and possibly even misleading thinking. Finally, fifth, or maybe sixth, fifth, how do we channel our humanitarian assistance? The vast part of the money, and this is only the money we can count through the reporting system, doesn't go to the beneficiaries directly. It goes first to large international organizations, both multilateral UN agencies and international NGOs. And some of the international NGOs are bigger than the UN agencies nowadays. They then pass it on to implementing partners who may be other agencies, UN agencies, or smaller NGOs, who then in, in their own turn contract local partners. Now, we, there, is no, there is no accountability or transparency, at least. So by the time the $1 you've contributed to the big agency comes down to the level of the person receiving it, who knows how much of it has gone in administration costs? You see, I think, I think we've, we've all known the money is wasted. No, it's For not. a very long time, I'm just wondering yeah. how you change that. All right. So how we change it is, uh, 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 but, well, the fundamental challenge is the issue of trust. You cannot change the system unless you regain trust. And in my view, there is uh, three things that need to happen to regain trust. One is, we need an independent system of measuring needs and evaluating outcomes. You can't have the same organizations deciding how much people deserve, who deserves it, then deciding who is to get it, and then deciding whether or not they've done well or not. We need an, international, uh, we need an independent mechanism for doing that. The second thing we need to do is that we need a more, much more objective needs assessment. Our problem is that when politicians have failed to bring solutions, and to be quite honest uh, with you, I have yet to come across a single conflict in the world, a single crisis that's ever been resolved. The, ever. This is because we don't resolve conflicts. Conflicts only resolve 
internally when people want. Outside, we just have to keep going until people are ready for it. So meanwhile, when politicians fail to bring peace, when military people fail to fight their way to peace, what do they do? They turn to humanitarians. Now you humanitarians do comprehensive approaches and so on and so forth. That I think is not, is not appropriate. We need to return to the basics of humanitarianism, which is altruism. And I'm afraid we have lost that altruism. I'd like to bring up altruism in, in a little while because there's an example of um, Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son, who's investing a lot of money in, in Africa with particular projects. R Richard, Professor Volk, can I ask you, I know you've got a sore throat, so you may have to stop and have a, a few sips of water. But in, in all the years that you've been involved, particularly in the Palestinian uh, problem, have you ever seen a an aid project that you think is a model for good? Do you think there is a right way of doing it and a wrong way of doing it? Well, I think the uh, use of humanitarian aid in a context like the Israel-Palestine conflict has to be seen in the context of geopolitics. And where I would uh, differ uh, from the prior speaker is to say that the fundamental issue is, to me, not trust but political will. And the political will of those that are governing the world is uh, conditioned by realism. And realism is related to national interests. And so until national interests are defined in such a way that, we, that uh, governments recognize that uh, helping Taking suffering seriously is part of what realism in the 21st century should mean. Uh, a humanitarian aid is an instrument of foreign policy. It's not really altruism. Altruism is the cover story. The real story is why is this aid being given here but not there? And we have to just live with that idea? rather than trying to say we're going to change it? Is, is it a real politic? No, we, can't, we should never live with the idea, but we should recognize its prevalence as the foundation for changing it. You see, Mukesh was um, shaking your head there and disagreeing. I don't agree. I completely fundamentally disagree. If we take the approach that the world is just a collection of national self-interest, then we will never resolve any conflict. I don't agree. This kind of argument takes us nowhere except a competition, which we've seen in every sphere from economics to uh, whatever. The politics that has got us to this situation is not the politics we want to recognize. We want to transform that politics. That's why Turkey is hosting this forum. Why recognize what we don't wish to tolerate anymore? We want a new order, not a way of adjusting and adjusting to the old, old order. I don't want to live in that world anymore. I've had enough. I've spent 30 years trying to deal uh, with the front lines of misery and usually things have got worse and worse and worse. We need new visions, new leaderships, and we have to challenge the current orthodoxy. I, I would like to suggest that we all interrupt each other because it, be, it makes it very interesting. Uh, Richard, I'm going to come back to you, if I may, in just a moment to enlarge on that point. But um, let me ask you, Dr. Torin, mean, you, you've worked a lot in Africa. Uh, you have some ideas that you want to put before the audience um, and before the panel as well that we can perhaps elaborate on, please. Okay. Can I see my presentation, please? Just, just want to use just that one second indeed, just to transfer, maybe you, you might look into Turkish system indeed. Yeah, I'm, I'm so delighted. That's, that's, that's a challenging system. Indeed. Gentlemen, that's, gentlemen that's we, ha we have a PowerPoint presentation just behind you. We will have time for that discussion. I know before you go, Dr. Akhtar, but please, Dr. Turner. These are general information, just uh, Turkish activities in uh, Africa, mainly diplomacy, commerce, Turkish airlines, development, and humanitarian aid. Um, first of all, in terms of diplomacy, you will see the figures that uh, Turkish influence in Africa. Um, and then uh, in commerce, that is also a big increase. Uh, at the moment, uh, export uh, import uh, total uh, trade is about $16 billion. And uh, I'm a bit quick because you told me to be quick. Uh, Turkish Airlines, again, you know, you will see. These are all Turkish uh, 
uh, way of you know the doing in Africa, then Turkish Airlines, commerce, you know this uh, humanitarian aid all together. And uh, let's go to Somalia as a case study. Uh, Somalia, uh, in Somalia, we have done uh, humanitarian aid uh, as well as development, peace building, and state building. Uh, if you look at uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> development, uh, you will see there are uh, two types of uh, uh, development we have done. One is uh, building infrastructure, which we build uh, hospitals, schools, roads, etc. And the other one is capacity building, which is mainly in education and skills development. The before I, we go, that I would like to tell you something. You know this, uh, we all talk about humanitarian aid. Um, if you only talk about humanitarian aid, uh, you only talk about this only for painkillers. Humanitarian is a, is a painkiller. You know, you need to, uh, the, there is no treatment in humanitarian aid. It's just to, you know, ease the pain for some time. So for long-term uh, development, commerce, investment, there are, these are the tools that, that Africa will turn the uh, corner. Otherwise, that humanitarian aid dependency will be a vicious cycle for Africa, for everywhere. So that's the reason uh, we talk about not just humanitarian aid in Africa, in Somalia, in that case, we worked on development also, in Somali case, we worked on uh, peace building and state building. As you know, after 20 years of civil war, there was no functional state. And uh, the, all the factions in, in the country were fighting uh, each other. So the peace building was the main tool also for stability. Uh, when you look at the principles, the main principles, uh, I have, uh, you know, the state here, and address the immediate uh, I think it is not good uh, turning this way. Okay, uh, address the immediate need for uh, first, then you know the humanitarian aid, then uh, then business. Sorry. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, Doctor. Rather than uh, I think it's uh, fi the microphone fighting so. with the um, technology which we have. Twenty-five yeah. percent of sub-Saharan African countries yeah. are rated to be poorer now than they were in 1960. How do you, if you put money into a particular country, measure success? Is it by increasing the wealth of the average citizen? Is it by seeing returns for your own investment because of contracts, etc.? How do you work out, and I'll put this question to Dr. Octay again in just a minute because you have to go soon. How do you work out success? How, how do we measure that? First of all, um, in Africa, there are many countries working in Africa, not just Turkey. Um, Turkey uh, concentrated on, uh, of course, you know, the Somalia was a kind of, you know, I can tell you that is, there was a, a fire. So you have to, you know, distinguish fire first. There was a famine and hunger in 2011. So Turkey's intervention is because of that uh, the big issue. Of course, you know, we, our activities, uh, I did not, uh, you know, mention the other, you know, because uh, we have to be quick. So all the other countries, TICA is working, Turkish Airlines working, and uh, other Turkish agencies, NGOs, they are working in all African countries. But that I know Somalia very well, that I take Somalia as a case study, not just uh, not, but would, would you uh, our say in, is not just uh, for Somalia. Would you say it has worked in Somalia? Because by some people's definition, it is still a failed state. It, it has major problems, as we've seen in the last 10 days. Um, of course, you know, this, uh, there, there is a long way to be a, a, a functional state for Somalia. But if you look at what uh, we are here uh, compared with 2011, so still, you know, there is a, a big improvement. Of course, the last 10 days, what happened is, is uh, terrorist activity, you know, this everywhere there, it, mm. it, it can happen. So 
is not just uh, uh, f focus on that issue, but if you focus on that uh, overall development, you know, the uh, state institutions, you know, uh, uh, parliament, uh, you know, uh, all also the federal state institutions, the, they come very long way. Okay, so, but we are talking principally about humanitarian aid on this panel. Richard, sorry, we, we did cut you short a, a little while ago. I just wanted to ask you, is, is it not necessary, therefore, to accept that you can never properly measure whether the money that has been put in, whether it's for self-serving interests, the contracts, or for altruistic reasons, you can never really measure whether it's been successful? Is it going to, okay, let's go below. <coughs> Please. Just maybe the, as, as far as the performance indicators are, uh, there are a couple of indicators in that we look, it, look into, not only within Turkey, but also outside of Turkey as well. Right now, we do provide help, humanitarian help, at the other side of Syria as well, in the other side of our borders, and Iraq as well, and in many other countries. Number of child deaths, number of kids attending schools, Number of percentage of people uh, who have access to housing and who do not who do not have who, who does need housing but do not have access to housing. Uh, again, percentage of people who are able to work and who do need to work but cannot find work. Uh, percentage of people again who do not need humanitarian aid anymore. That's basically maybe one of the best performance in the, regarding, remember, the, the uh, principle that let's not create dependent or welfare society. So even when we get into uh, providing humanitarian aid at the other side of the border, what we have done so far is started directly opening clinics, health service uh, centers. We have started opening, building and opening schools. Right now, there are more than 4,000 teachers indeed who have been teaching those kids. Our main goal is to address those root causes. If, let's say, Daesh has uh, found there a potential area uh, to create conflicts, so we have to reverse that situation. So the only way to reverse that situation is through education indeed. So, uh, again, when I meant by saying we have to take a holistic and systematic approach, any holistic and systematic approach requires very dedicated uh, performance indicators. In so, so may I ask Professor Falk? So we, we do follow up those statistics yeah. very closely. May I ask you, Professor Falk, Richard, you've studied a number of different models where do you think the most success comes from if you are targeting aid? I think the most success comes when the donors feel not only empathy, but that it's important to their own future that the problem be solved. And the best example of that, I think, is uh, what the U.S. did for Europe after World War II. That was a massive instance of humanitarian aid. What was known as the Marshall Plan. Yes, the Marshall Plan, which I think is a model that shows what can be achieved by humanitarian aid, provided the political will exists. And without that political will, you will get uh, an, uh, random uh, uh, responses that are bandages on gaping wounds. They are not solutions. Well, <clears throat> I, th I think these are extremely reasonable observations and I would not wish to disagree. But I've spent my life trying to find this elusive <coughs> creature called political will. What is it? I can define, I'm a doctor, I can define pulse, blood pressure, heartbeat. I cannot define political will. And when you have a concept so nebulous that is it not definable, that I do not see how that is a useful instrument for any public policy action. The reason there may not be this so-called political will is 
because there are so many other factors at play. And let me here say one more thing about dependence. Totally agree with you that we should do, reduce dependence. I was sitting in the Becca Valley last year uh, in, at Christmas at f zero degrees centigrade, right in the hill. A Syrian grandmother is sitting there with seven children because all her children, all her uh, you know, family is killed. Now, she's sitting under a leaking tent, and I was with, uh, with a very good organization called Islamic Relief, and I was sitting there, and you know, the thought struck me. Uh, what, am I going to, what are we going to do with this grandmother and her, and her seven children? Obviously, restore Syria so she can go back. Totally agree. But you know, don't speak about human dependence. It is not the, hum the victims that are dependent on humanitarian, humanitarian aid. No, I do, not know, I do not know of a single victim of a disaster or crisis anywhere in the world that ever wants to rely on humanitarian aid for a moment longer than is necessary. So it's very, very important we don't blame the victim for the problems that are out there. Our problem is, may well be with the system, our problem may well be with the root causes, etc. But for the dear friends, if we cannot sustain our compassion long enough, possibly for years, possibly for decades, in these intractable situations, then what is it that we are talking about as Mukesh, far as humanitarianism is concerned? Mukesh, we have to say goodbye to Dr. Hukta and, and thank you very much for your contribution, you. sir. Maybe just uh, last word. If you, if, if, no it, it's up to you. you. No. I don't want to upset your staff, but you're entitled to. No matter what we do, uh, through the humanitarian aid, the solution lies with the political, at the political level indeed. So unless we provide solutions, political solutions to those conflicts, no matter wherever those conflicts are, rises from. So we will continue providing humanitarian aid and the end results, if that's the right way to put it, whether they are conflicts or terror or war or whatever it is, will continue. So uh, we have to increase our efforts to decrease the amount of differences within the regions in terms of, in terms of development, developmental projects indeed. So there are too much gap in between different parts of the world, which again, one of the main, I strongly believe that causes of uh, the conflicts. Thank you. Not to talk about the energy, oil and natural resources, of course. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Indeed. Very glad to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I believe that we're coming to a certain conclusion about is political will sometimes Im means imposing political will to some extent. And, and that was what happened with the Marshall Plan, to which you referenced. It was incredibly successful in helping to restore Europe, but it came at a price. And the price was, in the, in the UK's example, for one thing, you know, do less with your colonies. Um, there was lend-lease. There, there were so many conditions attached. But it was also motivated by the sense that if Europe isn't helped to restore its economy, the Great Depression that existed in the 30s would return. That was the political motive that gave the political energy that allowed this shift of resources to take place. And as far as my friend on my right is concerned, uh, I don't see that a political will, of course, is vague and uh, easily manipulated, but so is trust, the word you introduced. I see no clarity in uh, resting one's hopes for a transformed humanitarian aid on trust, given the way the world is organized and the way the leadership and the trends toward increased nationalism are occurring. I just don't see that as an avenue toward a hopeful future. Can, can I just bookend this? Uh, uh, in a sense, your book, it, you're the middle of the book, but we have two doctors either end of this. So let's talk to you about your work in the field of medicine. What difficulties now exist that um, need specifically to be tackled in terms of humanitarian aid? First of all, um, actually, you know, this uh, uh, maybe uh, Mukesh uh, would misunderstood what I said. I didn't blame the victim. I blamed actually donors 
that the, because of the humanitarian <coughs> aid dependency. Actually, you know, this, we, we need to, of course, we need the compassion, keep the compassion. However, we need to move from compassion to mutual partnership. So, Professor Fox's example is a very good, actually. That is a typical development aid, not the humanitarian aid, the post -war, World War II, uh, you know, a Marshall Plan. So, improve the economy of uh, Europe. So then they join the you know, world economy. So same as uh, we can do in Africa, rather than just, uh, you know, this, uh, as the you know, Japanese says, you know, this, rather than giving <coughs> fish, you know, you need to uh, teach how to catch fish. So that is the issue. We need to move to this phase. Of course, you know, when there is need, we need to, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, provide uh, humanitarian aid, but our focus should move to development and, uh, and the mutual partnership in, in, in commerce. I, I put the question out there um, as to you as a doctor. Uh, I'm sure we'll, your, your world encompasses so many different elements when it comes to this. But would, would you accept, I guess, that um, smallpox was eradicated as a result of international aid? That there have been major medical successes? Oh, absolutely, and uh, I've no argument with aid and I have no argument with development aid. What I have a strong argument with is confusing humanitarian aid and development aid. You know, I do not think the Marshall Plan, by the way, was a humanitarian program. Mm -hmm. There might be an element of it led by Oxfam and other organizations feeding the starving people of Europe uh, at that time. But Marshall aid was a classical development program of investment mm -hmm. in a way. So my problem is, remember this session is called humanitarianism, it's not called aid. I think, the, I think a confused intellectual thinking, which is you combine all forms of one group of people helping another group of people and you lump them all together into a, into a, into a mess. But and but then it, you say, oh, why is it solving the world's problems? No, for humanitarian aid, we have to come back to the fundamentals which is, is the unconditional provision of assistance to a person in distress without qualification. And, and would you include in that definition of distress people who are, are living in poverty and for whom the development aid might provide an opportunity to get out of Well, at the margin, at, at the margin. So, so, I mean, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the two things have to overlap. Oh, yes, the two things can overlap, but the, but the way you do humanitarian aid is very different from the way you do development aid. It's like going to a doctor and say, well, I've got a pain, in my, a pain in, my, in, my, in my toe, and I've got a pain in my heart, and the doctor says, well, let us take a holistic, comprehensive approach to you. What nonsense is that? You know, I want my toe pain sorted out. I want my heart pain sorted out. So what I'm saying is the reason the humanitarian system is not working is that we, in our vague thinking and a self-interested thinking are trying to solve all the world's problems with a very limited instrument. And you can't, I mean, my grandmother in Becca Valley is still sitting there. What am I going to say to her? Development assistance is going to come. One day the conflict in Syria will be over. And then your leaky tent will be all right. Meanwhile, by the way, you will get cold, you'll get pneumonia, your children will get measles, etc., etc. I mean, come on, guys. You know, uh, uh, this is why we had the World Humanitarian Summit here two years ago to say that while the world seeks solutions to problems to which are very difficult to solve, we will not forget those who are in their most desperate moments. And all of us in our most desperate moments need a word of comfort, a word of assistance. We don't want to be told we are building up your capacity for long-term development and you're going to lift yourself up and rebuild your uh, uh, whatnot. Sure, these are the dreams we can aspire to. I want help now if you like. And that's what people around the world are crying out for. Well, the people if you of can't Palestine, hear those cries, then I do not know how, how you can call yourself humanitarians. Okay, so the people of Palestine since the late 1940s have been receiving aid through the United Nations Relief Works Agency. These days I think it has a budget of roughly one billion dollars a year. It's a subject that Richard Falk has studied intensely. Uh, it has 28,000 staff. Is that development aid or is that humanitarian aid? Because there hasn't been a great deal of development. Asking Richard this. Well, I, th I think that uh, what has been done for, uh, in relation to Palestine uh, through the UNRWA and the UN is really uh, trying to uh, keep a 
terrible catastrophe within acceptable political boundaries. And in a way, it's uh, transferring the responsibility that Israel really has to the international community and waiting for a solution to come that has never come. Without this aid, would things perhaps have had to accelerate differently? Hmm. Of course, the only way that it could have created a uh, cycle uh, that was benign rather than a vicious cycle was to enable development to be the end result. And therefore, you, it's artificial to separate them. And if you... It's true that many NGOs are motivated by trying to make the world a better place and to uh, create a uh, sense that uh, society does take suffering seriously. But that's not the way the main flows of humanitarian aid are given or withheld. I'm going to ask you each in just a moment to, to, to come up with a better model. But I'm also going to ask the audience, because we have about 25 minutes left, we've got a, a long time, and I know that there will be a lot of questions. <coughs> if somebody could put their hand up in just a moment, I see at least one person there. It can't be out of 300 people, only one person who wants to ask a question. Uh, two such fascinating guests. So we'll keep them coming. But, Connie, if I could ask you first of all, if you could change one particular thing, and as Mukesh was saying, let's define it as humanitarian aid rather than development aid, rather than aid overall. If there was one particular thing that you could say, I would like to see that changed and it would be changed for the better, can you think of any one particular thing? You mean in case of Somalia or in no, general? No, in, in, the, in the bigger picture. In a bigger picture, you know, there's, of course humanitarian aid is, aid is a big instrument uh, we can use to ease pain. And if you in any, any, any disaster, any uh, international disaster, if you, uh, you know, change this, that is great. You know, this, as, a, as a doctor, of course, you know, if you save one person, you know, if you treat one person, that is, uh, that is the achievement. But uh, we need to look at the bigger picture. You know, if you talk about just, you know, humanitarian aid for Palestinians and not to talk about that illegal occupation of Israel, that, is, uh, that does not solve problems. So we need to talk real issues. Of course, the humanitarian aid is important. We need to, we need to uh, provide who need it. But if you uh, if you stuck in just humanitarian aid and then don't go beyond, this is not uh, solve any problems. But if you save one person, that is great. You know, as, a, as a doctor, I'm saying. I would like to see the microphone presented to the gentleman uh, with his hand up in this row, any of the technical staff available to, to do so. Uh, if you could get a microphone, I think there'll be a number of people. There's a lady there in uh, the white top who I think would like to ask a question afterwards. Perhaps when this gentleman's asked his question, you, you don't mind nipping over and, and grabbing it so that we don't have to call people up again. Uh, Richard, same question to you. My uh, immediate uh, proposal would be uh, to restrict the use of the veto within the Security Council in such a way that uh, the five permanent members agreed not to use or were uh, uh, told not to use uh, the veto in issues involving humanitarian aid and humanitarianism in general. Can you give examples of where that has happened? Well, uh, dealing with the uh, issues of uh, refugees in uh, uh, Bangladesh at the present time, the spillover from uh, Rohingya, there are many, many situations where a humanitarian policy is blocked by political conflict. And it's a test of the sincerity of governments if the five veto powers agree that in humanitarian contexts they will not invoke their right of veto. I'm also thinking about the time in the uh, 
early 1980s with Ethiopia when the British were told by the Ethiopians you can't bring planes in here but they were told on the quiet that yes they could and they took a risk and, and did so but the political will there was nobody there to bend the arm of the Ethiopian government. Well, I'll come to you in a minute if I may but I want to ask uh, first of all this gentleman here do you have a working microphone could you say who you are uh, yes, and um, perhaps you could address a question yes. to the panel rather than making a statement. I'll try it. <laughs> Ad Hamizia, Oxcaps, and University of Oxford. A um, couple of very short questions. The first question I'd be uh, interested to hear from any one of our panelists would be um, to address this arbitrary 0.7%. Though I understand it's ODA, but if we go with John uh, David's uh, point on sort of intertwining. Which is the amount of international aid the as a percentage that of only GDP. A few wealthy nations yeah. actually meet. So, of course, Arthur Lewis, Ralph Prebish is sort of genesis on that front. Um, the second point I'd be interested in, something that we mentioned briefly, would be to think about um, how we are really going to address graft. You mentioned Palestine, and I won't uh, uh, you know, get done for any sort of defamation or <laughs> similar on, on the PLO side, but if you could say anything on uh, the role of graft and humanitarian aid. Uh, and finally, on the point of altruism, which I believe is utopian, and I actually agree a lot, <laughs> a lot more with um, Professor Falk, um, the very... I mean, it was demonstrated by the undersecretary that this is politically in inherent, foreign aid is politically inherent. The fact that we're branding this, we're ranking, you know, it's, uh, we're showing off, it's nation branding, it's soft power and so on and so forth. So the point on altruism, I think, is really something that, you know, one can wish for, but in reality, I think it's a pipe dream. And Who I wants to take the, the, the question of, I, of graft and bribery first? Uh, uh, well, I want to talk about altruism. Uh, I, I don't agree. Even, uh, I, by now you now know that I probably don't agree with many, many things, but that's why I'm a professor, I guess. Uh, humanitarianism, the sense of helping someone in distress is the oldest instinct known to humanity. I can tell you for a fact that despite the billions spent by the Turkish government on Syrians, the amount that the Turkish people have done to open their homes and hearts to the Syrian refugees far exceeds the, the assistance of the Turkish government. And this is so in every country, every theater. So I don't agree. The, the reason I don't agree is that altruism is a foundation of human society. And just because it, doesn't, it isn't quantified, we don't see it in appeals and documents, doesn't mean say it doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. People, look at in the UK, in, back in the UK, they're opening their homes to the refugees even though the government will not let anyone in. So, so I think we have to build on that altruism, which is a norm rather than it's a, is, is a norm. And on the percentage uh, uh, business, the problem is this, that when you have a, it's not about 0.7% and how much of that should be humanitarian or whatever. We need an unlimited commitment. We need to define what humanitarian aid is very narrowly. And then we need to have a universal. After all, we have universal education. Uh, we are committed to. We have universal uh, uh, health cover. We have uh, all those universal things. Why can we not commit to an idea that if you are struck by a conflict or struck by a disaster, and there's a disaster every second in the world now, a natural disaster, then th there's a system that will provide for your basic needs until you can get up on your feet again. Now, there are many, many ideas and ways of doing this. We already do that domestically in many, many countries. So doing it internationally is not actually that difficult. And this is where our friend political will uh, comes in. Well, let, let, let's, let's take one of the other points as well, which I think you used the word graft, did you? Uh, bribery, backsheesh. It's whatever. a very tiny proportion. Well, it isn't in, in many African countries, but I think the point I wanted to make with, um, let's, let's bring Richard in here. I mean, I've spent time in, in Gaza, I've spent time in the West Bank, and I have met, particularly in Gaza, some extremely wealthy Palestinians who seem to be taking advantage of the system. Uh, I'm not suggesting that they particularly took any bribes, but they take advantage of the money that's coming in to help rebuild. Is that okay? Sorry, uh, that's to Professor Falk. <laughs> there you go. Of course I think not. Of course not. But the, uh, corruption and uh, that kind of uh, manipulation of aid funds is embedded in a process which has been uh, described by 
uh, others in this panel uh, that doesn't really I inspire a sense that aid is about altruism. It gives the sense that aid is mixed up with all kinds of other things, including trying to take advantage of it as a way of uh, gaining personal wealth. And so, so you have uh, mixed motivations mm -hmm. that are very much at odds with each other. I think one thing this TRT forum represents is raising altruistic consciousness in the world. And I think that is something that would benefit the kind of perspective that you're... But we, that's... We, which is all that's whether one talks about education or media, we need to convince more and more people that altruism and empathy and self-interest are not at odds. Because Mukesh was making the point earlier that after that conference two years ago, a lot of fine words there, but not a lot of action. But even if one person changes their mind, perhaps it is yeah. a good thing. Uh, Dr. Tarle, Let you wanted to talk make a about point. Yes, absolutely. Corruption. Um, <coughs> actually, this is kind of disease mainly because of the UN agencies. You know, the UN agencies, the, uh, the, the type of working that they produce the local corrupts. They work with <coughs> local corrupt people and, uh, <coughs> and uh, their own uh, rich people that, uh, you know, they're working with the uh, UN agencies. The, one of our success in Somalia, we avoided UN agencies and uh, used uh, the aid directly working with the Somali authorities and the local Somali NGOs. That's the, uh, the, the, the success comes mainly from this. So perhaps it is, uh, we'll come to you in just a moment if we may, perhaps the idea is, as somebody suggested a short while ago, uh, philanthropic donations. And I, and I mentioned Howard Buffett, who's teaching farmers in Africa how better to use what seems to them to be in fertile land and to make it fertile land, uh, and they can then change their livelihoods there. That's something we may come to in, in a moment. But if, if there's a question you would like to ask. Could you say who you are and to whom you'd like to address the question? Is it working now? Can the technical staff please make sure that the microphone is on? Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to speakers for their talks. And I would like to direct my question at Professor Falk. Um, Professor, in your talk, you mentioned that there are two key things for humanitarian aid. And these are, uh, you said, empathy and for the country to need that the problem be solved. On one hand, we are in a context where we write Islamophobia, Islamophobia, and a lot of these are the top aid-giving countries. So I was wondering, how do you see the future of humanitarian aid in such a context? Thank you. I'm not sure I understood. Uh, could you rephrase the question? Try, try one more time, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, because it is cutting off. The microphone okay. is cutting off. Yeah, it um, was difficult to hear. Sure. Is it more clear? Go is, ahead. Okay. Um, so, in your talk, Professor, you mentioned that uh, there are two key things that are necessary for humanitarian aid to be successful. And you said these are empathy and uh, f for the country to need that the solution, a solution be found. Um, we currently live in a context where there is a rise of xenophobia, Islamophobia in a lot of these aid-given countries, these top five countries. How do you see the future of humanitarian aid in such a context? Where do you see empathy in this? Thank you. There's so much hate out there. How can people be expected to be empathetic? I think is the gist of it. No, well, of, of course, that's uh, part of the construction of an empathetic political will, overcoming these internal uh, prejudices and uh, uh, cultural clashes that are occurring. And again, one of the functions of a forum like this is to make people talk to each other who come from different normative backgrounds. Can I ask you, Mukesh and Kari, as doctors who've worked in extremely dangerous places, when it comes to delivering your version of humanitarian aid, which, which may be your experience rather than the medicine, is there some kind of international protocol we could agree on that would make the work that 
doctors and other practitioners in these situations to make their lives safer and therefore the work that they do more likely to be successful? Uh, yes, and we already have it. I, I think the issues were not universal, but before I, uh, let me just come back on a factual issue. It's very important because we're being uh, we're live on corruption. To blame corruption is like providing an alibi for all those people who don't want to give any assistance, including Islamophobia and all that. Do you know how much we spend on humanitarian aid through the UN system? $27 billion. Do you know how much we spend on chewing gum? More than that. Now, you tell me, $27 billion, how much corruption can there be? And does it make a difference? I wish there was enough aid going into places to actually make a difference so that corruption would actually have an impact. Aid is marginal. I do not know of a single situation that has been strategically shifted by corruption. Corruption is bad. It brings down the reputation of aid and humanitarianism. It's immoral. It's unethical. All of that. But don't blame corruption. And corruption comes in many forms. Sure, there might be corruption at a, a little uh, person level sitting in a, re a refugee camp. What about the big forms of corruption that are taking place in the way the international system works about which countries, whose employees, this, that, and I the other? I suppose it, it all depends which figures you, you take on board. No, no, if you look at if you look at grants, loans, technical advice, debt forgiveness, and money just given, the figure well, from the OECD not, well, yeah, is 130 billion. Well, that's not humanitarian aid. No, but coming but to it's a, development aid as well. But development, debt forgiveness, yeah, but which development may be aid, But even development aid, we are here talking about maybe $300 billion, which is about 10 times humanitarian aid. That's the general figure mm. we're talking here about. And debt forgiveness, well, is debt forgiveness aid? When actually you are given odious debt in the first place and put people in, it's like going, a bank gives you a loan and when you can't pay because a bank uh, gave you a bad loan, and then you blame the victim for it. But you but did mention... You did mention that there was a protocol already in place yes. for so, protection. So, yeah, it yeah. doesn't work. Well, I think th this is because, you know, we cannot work by simply by formula. This is where we need to come back and come back to altruistic system. If we can ha imagine a system where the provision of humanitarian assistance is shared by all countries. We already do this for peacekeeping. I mean, when you have a UN peacekeeping, there are, I mean, the peacekeeping, by the way, costs more than humanitarian aid. Now, nobody argues about the cost of peacekeeping, and these operations like in South Sudan, in uh, um, uh, CAR, they cost billions, right? And the way it is that every country in the world pays, Tuvalu may pay $10,000, uh, the United States may pay, uh, you know, $10 million. It's according to the UN uh, formula. Now, imagine a system where the maintenance and care of refugees and other humanitarian uh, uh, needy people is decided not on the basis of who you are, where you are, but on the basis of a shared burden. It would be extremely affordable, the cost of chewing gum in the world. And every country would bear that. Now, there's already work on how to make a system that is universal, that doesn't rely on the generosity of the United States, which comes with conditionality, and more and more, the American aid is toxic. Gone are the days of the Marshall Plan, by the way. You know, if we ever have a Marshall Plan from the United States today, run from it. It'll create more problems than it's solved. You only have to look at what's happened in the Middle East uh, to, to solve that. And let's not get started on Palestine, by the way, because if we get in there, we will see all the problems that come from providing conditional, uh, uh, conditional aid. So, yes, the answer to your question is we, we need the protocol is about having a world system which genuinely believes in putting everyone in the same uh, boat. We already have that in other areas of life. After all, when you have two aeroplanes in the sky, they don't crash into each other. We have a global system of communications between planes. We have that. We have eradicated smallpox. We have eradicating polio. You know, there are, it is perfectly possible. And the <coughs> issue is not money. The issue is not resources. We have it in more than measure. And this is where I agree with you. What we call political will or trust comes in. We, we have about six minutes left. Uh, We've talked an awful lot about the people who desperately need the help, but what we haven't talked about is the incredibly brave work of those people who provide the help. And it constantly amazes me that so many people continue to do it in the face of such extraordinary dangers. A, a word for those people who do provide aid, Dr. Cohn. 
Um, first of all, uh, I would like to continue that argument, that corruption argument. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the issue is that uh, is not the blaming the locals because of corruption. The blaming the system, that is the reason we need to change system. Currently, no more than 20% arrive, arrive in the end user uh, from true U UN system. So, uh, of course, the political will is important, but if you do not set up a b better system that uh, the, uh, use the money effectively, so after all, that political will, sometimes maybe they say, you know, there is no difference, you know, why, why we are paying this, this and that amount of money. Uh, that is the reason that we need to change the system. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Wright, you know, the last humanitarian aid conference that we didn't, uh, uh, we, we talk about changing system, but nobody changed system because most of the actors also, they are benefiting the current system. Another question from the audience, and, and this is not favoritism simply because you happen to be wearing a, a dark blue suit, dark blue shirt and a red tie, but the gentleman dressed exactly as I am next to him. Would you please ask, ask your question and direct it at the panel? Uh, is yeah. it okay? Can you hear me? Uh, keep, keep it close to your mouth and okay. we will. My question Several is questions. to uh, uh, Professor Gunkesh. I have seen here that everybody is saying the Turkish government and the Turkish society did well uh, by the humanitarian aid. So what is the reason for it? Why the Turkish society is altruistic than the other ones? And what is the uh, common uh, value of the Turkish people that makes us more altruistic and more ready to help others? And we have seen two big leaders of our uh, society who are ready to commit their life in uh, Somalia or in other places of the world. But this is why it's only Turkey or why Turkey is mar more in front of the others on this race of the humanitarian help. I'm gonna come and grab the microphone while that question is answered. I think, bring uh, it over here. Uh, uh, I admire the Turkish people and the Turkish government. And I'm saying that not because I'm sitting here as your guest, but quicker, thank you. Turkish people are empathic and Turkish government has been very generous. But I do not think that the Turkish are special. I can't, I can't you know, there, uh, in Iran, in Pakistan, who provided most of the humanitarian aid to those refugees from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan for decades, far longer than the Syrian uh, conflict? You know, it, international aid was minuscule proportion of the bulk of the aid provided by the Iranian authorities and the Iranian public. In Iran, there weren't even refugee camps because the refugees were just doing ordinary life elsewhere. So this is what I'm saying. Humanitarianism is not a profession, a monopoly, uh, somehow the business of a government or an institution or an organization or a system. It is the core instinct of human beings. Now, can we not think of a system of mobilizing that? You know, after all, uh, iPhone or Coca-Cola didn't have great systems to try and get us to all use iPhones or drink Coca-Cola. So please don't underestimate the power of humanity and the power of people. This is why I disagree with so many of the institutional people. And I've spent all my life in humanitarian institutions and governments, by the way, so I'm well qualified to criticize my own life uh, in, uh, in a way. Okay, we don't you. want that. We want a world where humanitarianism is natural, instinctive, shared, universal, and with all the technologies and innovations at our disposal, <coughs> extremely possible. There are 100 ways of doing it, 100 examples, and we had 100 times more time now than we do, then we can discuss it even more. Mukesh, thank you very much indeed. So do, do you have a, an answer to that or a question? I have, I have a question, actually. Can I ask? Of course you may, but make it one question and keep it brief if you would. I will try to. So first of all, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Oh. I would like to thank you for, thank you TRT World for hosting this event for us. And I would like to thank honorable moderator for providing me with this microphone. Can you ask a question please? Okay, I'm gonna ask. I have a question regarding Mr. Kani Torun. By, by the way, my name is Ömer Öztürk. I'm a university student. So, uh, Mr. Karnatorun, in your presentation, uh, you presented us the 
humanitarian aids being provided to the people who are in need of help in Africa, like the country of Somalia. But uh, as the founder of the Doctors Worldwide, can you give us some examples of the humanitarian aids being provided to the countries that suffer from famine drought outside the Africa, like the people who are suffering uh, from uh, being slaughtered by Buddhists in Arakan in Myanmar? Thank you. If, if, if you could provide the microphone to that, that lady there. Does anybody want to respond so, to that? Uh, <clears throat> the presentation was about Africa. I don't, uh, this presentation is not about doctors worldwide. So the, it was about Turkish activities in Africa. That's the reason I mentioned about as a case study Somalia. So uh, if we talk about the general humanitarian aid uh, around the globe, so we can talk about, of course, Myanmar and others. But at the moment, uh, the, the presentation was the case uh, study of Somalia. Madam, in the second row. Um, okay. I Keep the microphone quite yeah. close. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, Mr. Cameron. Uh, there's a convention on humanitarian aid. It's not well known, but there's a convention. Only donor countries are member. And this convention's name changed in 2012 from humanitarian aid to humanitarian assistance, which means humanitarian aid is not I'm enough. Sorry to rush you, we but do you have a question? Is, these are the oldest countries. We know that if the United, if the Turkey is the second in this as a donor country, why Turkey is not a member among the donor countries for this uh, convention? It goes over the top of my head slightly, I'm afraid. Can, can I think uh, this uh, question should be towards the uh, Fuat Oktay. He was uh, in the government side. I'm not in the government side. At the moment, I'm in the legislative side. I'm an MP. So I don't know the exact reason. I think you should ask this question to the government. We are only freeze of transportation going to let the lady there who now has the microphone ask a question. And, and you get a prize for brevity. <laughs> oh, we do have difficulty with this, don't we? Perhaps it might be easier just to put the microphone down and shout it out loudly, madam. The political will and good will make wonders for humanitarian aid. And you also brought uh, it is not effective or efficient, but I think there's a two sides of it, emergency response and development to humanitarian aid. So my question is, do you think that we all should be political will and goodwill for developmental humanitarian aid? Okay, what can we do today to make what we as a panel, particularly you as a panel, believe should happen to make it happen? To make what okay, happen? We, uh, political will. Yes. Well, I, uh, for, uh, my problem is that it depends on whose political will. Do I want Trump's political will? Do I want the Myanmar government's political will? Do I want Theresa May's political will? God save us from such political wills. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't want political will of politicians. I want political will of the people in the name of humanity. And that only way to do that is to mobilize that mass humanity. As I said earlier, humanitarianism is not the monopoly of politicians. The last thing we want to do is to politicize humanitarian aid even further. Do you want the European Union's political will, which is stopping these migrants coming into, into Europe? No thanks. I think it's, a wrong, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but it's a wrong uh, solution down that route. We're going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Not just to the three remaining panelists that we have and to uh, the fourth panelist we had, but to the, I wouldn't call them questionnaires, would you? I'd call them panelists out in the audience. Thank you very much indeed for coming along for this fascinating discussion. Apologies for some of the technical glitches. I think it's to do with transmitters. But I hope some ground has been made up in this discussion. <laughs> it's been wide-ranging. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking part. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>